Let us begin with the brain teaser. We are going to be looking at some data from a recent study published from The Lancet. Now keep in mind we're only comparing individuals which have received their first vaccination and it's greater than 21 days. So enough time for it to, in other words, take hold. As compared to individuals which are not vaccinated or just freshly poked. You see where I'm going with this? So this is what the study is looking at. Now keep in mind we have a pretty, not a good p-value here. And there, we're going to predicate the research with this crude descriptive frequencies are unadjusted for age and other confounders. So more research needs to be done. But still just the same. Let's look at the data. Alpha variant. Unvaccinated or freshly poked. 1.9% of those individuals received, well, she should say received, required hospital admission. Of the basically individuals which required emergency care attendance of the alpha variant, 3.9% that were unvaccinated or just freshly poked. Compare to the individuals which received the first vaccine and are waiting for the second, so they've been over 21 days, 3.4%. Emergency care, 5.3%. So 5.3% versus 3.9%. 3.4% versus 1.9%. Alpha variant, hard to find. Delta variant, everywhere. Unvaccinated after first vaccination or just freshly poked, 2.2%. 21 days after receiving the first vaccine, waiting for the second, 2.3%. Unvaccinated or just freshly poked, 5.5%. Reference to emergency care attendance. Greater than 21 days after the first vaccine, waiting for the second, 6.4%. Now, now, the thing is, you could add publisher bias in there. It could do a lot of confounding. But the data there is still there. And it's a pretty interesting trend. Now, whether there's some bi uh, biases or confounding that we're not aware of that can basically cause those numbers to be hot, you know, give the impression that we have a pattern when we really don't, that will be for others to discover. However, though, just the same, the data as it stands, without taking into account any other confounders or unadjusted for age and so on and so forth, is pretty intriguing because the argument that's often made publicly uh, in reference to the current inquisition, have you been vaccinated, have you not been vaccinated? If you are not vaccinated, then you are guilty of sin. But that argument in reference to transmission or at least in this case, let's take transmission out of that's probably not the best word for it. Uh, hospitalization doesn't seem to take hold, at least comparing the partially vaccinated to the unvaccinated or just received a shot. Now, interesting enough, this is from the Lancet article, that is the research. As people read it, they automatically believe they're making a comparison between fully vaccinated individuals and unvaccinated. No. That's not the comparison, but still read through it. The links will be there with all the research as follows. Now, let us begin. It is 2.07 a.m. Good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, bioinformatics, biostatisticians, bio basic epidemiologists, policymakers, and all those data-oriented individuals, just the same. What we'll be covering tonight is pretty much just uh, comparison, uh, correlation, causation type stuff. Uh, in reference to mask use, antibody responses, uh, viral shedding amongst the uh, vaccinated, uh, the approval process of the vaccines and some pretty serious questions that have to be answered in reference to that, and airborne transmission. Uh, we, our data sources for the fact checkers will be the European database of neurovigilance, VAERS, with a particular caveat. Reports to VAERS are exactly that. They are unverifiable, coincidental, inaccurate, and incomplete. They are just simply reports to VAERS, and VAERS has to give it validity. If they ever actually had to take the time to give it validity, our world and data have been a hero this entire pandemic. Great data collection, as well as GIS aid, 
great source checker for basically outbreak information as well as variants of concern. Let's get right into the data as follows. First one we looked at was as we looked at the unvaccinated or basically recently vaccinated, but not enough time for the vaccine to kick in, if that makes any sense, uh, seemed to fare pretty well compared to those which already had that first vaccine at a two, I assume, fully settled in. Again, I don't want to add publisher bias to it, but there's something there I would like to see elucidated in the future because the numbers don't really look good in a certain direction. Again, that data will be posted uh, as we speak in the future. But to proceed, I'm going to go into this one. I didn't cover this one right off the bat, but I should have. Do, do, do. All right. Comparing SARS-CoV-2 natural immunity to vaccine-induced immunity reinfections versus breakthrough infections. Let us begin. I don't want to read more into it than actually what the publisher had produced, but let's start with the conclusion. This study demonstrates that natural immunity confers longer lasting and stronger protection against infection, symptomatic disease, and hospitalization caused by the Delta variant. Remember, it is the variant of the day. And this variant has overtaken everything. So a lot of focus on how vaccines work and how mitigation uh, factors work play into the Delta variant. Compared to those who received a fully vaccinated in this case, as opposed to the Lancet prior, the BNT162B two-dose vaccine-induced immunity. Individuals who were both previously infected with SARS and then got vaccinated later on even had better resistance. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean less hospitalization? Does it mean less symptomatic uh, sensations? Uh, I don't know, but whatever it is, they have greater protection if they've been vaccinated and had the sickness, but they're pretty darn well protected according to the study, if they have naturally acquired immunity. So let us proceed into the research as follows. The size of the study first. Here we go. Scrolling down real fast, fast, da, 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 da. All right, so we're not talking a small study. You see the numbers there? To proceed. Down, going a little further, here we go. Our analysis, quoting obviously, demonstrates that SARS-CoV-2 naive vaccines had a 13.06-fold increased risk for breakthrough infection with the Delta variant compared to those previously infected. 13.06 fold increased risk for breakthrough infection compared to those which had been exposed prior. Previous infected when the first event infection or vaccination occurred during the January and February 2021, the increased risk was significant for symptomatic disease as well forward. Although the results could suggest waning natural immunity against Delta variant, those vaccinated are still at a 5.96 fold increase for breakthrough infection and a 7.13 fold increase risk for symptomatic disease compared to those previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 many vaccines who are also at greater risk for COVID-19 related hospitalization compared to those who were previously infected. All right. So you get the gist. Natural infection kicks butt over vaccine-induced infection. So when the argument is being postulated in reference to a pandemic of the unvaccinated, uh, that is really a half-truth. And obviously, the wording is very inflammatory and not based upon science at all. It is based upon, actually, vigilantism. Unfortunately, in the wrong direction. But to proceed as follows, as you can see, natural infection works really well. Now, if individuals that were naturally infected and then got the vaccine or received the vaccine, they have even better protection, but they don't have the data to support how much better. You know what I mean? How much better. Or exactly how it is better. But to proceed as follows. Do, 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 Sound effects yes, for scrolling. The analysis demonstrated that natural immunity affords longer lasting and stronger protection against infection. Symptomatic disease and hospitalization due to the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 compared to BNT162B2 two-dose vaccine-induced immunity. Notably, individuals who were previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 and given a single dose of the BNT162B2 vaccine gained additional protection against the Delta variant. The long-term protection provided by a third dose recently administered in Israel is still unknown. And keep that in mind, third dose, right? Third dose. 
because as we proceed forward, uh, all right, we've already concluded the natural infection kicks butt over fully vaccinated uh, vaccine-induced immunity or whatever. If it's a breakthrough. It's not really immunity, is it? But proceed. All right. They're already working on the fourth dose. Because if one didn't do it, and two didn't do it, and three didn't do it, then four has to be better. And many of you are already aware that a lot of countries are now saying you can't travel to their country unless you receive a vaccine within 10 months of travel being fully vaccinated. So you can see how that can even lead to even multiple doses on top of multiple doses, five, six, seven doses, whenever this ends, because obviously when you have a pandemic where the disease is endemic, for those not familiar, meaning not going away, like the common cold, uh, there's going to be at the point of time when we're going to have to get over this. You see what I mean? But four doses now, we're working on that. So let us begin. Viral shedding. Shedding infections of SARS-CoV-2 despite vaccination. Everyone's just under the impression that it's the unvaccinated that transmit, and that's what's creating a lot of hostility and anger. That may have been an assumption when the vaccines came out by certain policymakers and politicians, which over embellished the effect of certain inoculations in order to garner greater public support, but au contraire. Let us proceed with actual data. Are you ready for data? Here we go. Low CT values, remember the RPCT or whatever the test, you know, this thing right here, RTPCR, uh, whereas detected and vaccinated people regardless of symptoms at the time of testing. CT values of under 25 were detected in seven of the 24 unvaccinated, 29%. Nine to 11 fully vaccinated individuals, 82%. Now, if we were popular in sensationalizing information, you see exactly how that can be done, i.e. infotainment, i.e. what they like to consider themselves as news, but i.e. they like to interview other journalists and interview each other as opposed to actually interviewing people that are responsible for the news. So if we were to sensationalize, you can see how we do this. Basically, we'll say the unvaccinated 29% 29% had low CT values, as opposed to the fully vaccinated, which is 82%. They go on. Let's go to symptomatic cases. 158 of the 232, and 156 of the 225 fully vaccinated symptomatic individuals. Time from symptom onset to testing did not vary by vaccination status. Infectious virus detected in the sole specimen, da 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 Indicated that even asymptomatic fully vaccinated people might shed the infection virus. Now, the operative word there is might. Uh, we have the data here, which gives a good outlook of the possibility that it may be highly probable. But the researcher here took a cautious approach and said, hey, let's review the data. Let's get a peer a review released. See maybe if other researchers or data or statisticians see something that basically we did not uh, that could have added to confounding, you know, biased our answer. Combined with other studies, these data indicate that vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals infected with the Delta variant, not talking the prior variants, which they keep on referring studies to. Great. All right, you beat the alpha, but with now the Delta is everywhere. Now, the Delta variant might transmit infection. Importantly, we show that infectious SARS-CoV-2 is frequently found even in vaccinated persons when specimen CT values are low. The inclusion of viruses from the Pango lineages B1617-2A1, A2, and A3 in multiple counties without a linking outbreak indicate that the Delta lineage SARS-CoV-2 can achieve low CT values consistent with transmissibility in fully vaccinated individuals across a range of settings. That's why they started moving from vaccinated to unvaccinated should get tested. But even then, here's the catch. All these countries going, hey, you need to be vaccinated within 10 months of traveling to us. But yet, a fully vaccinated individual may still the same viral load, as we discussed earlier, as the unvaccinated. Maybe it's more a problem with the vaccine. But ha, I discuss and I add publisher bias because that's not what the researcher was trying to, to uh, conclude. But the questions are there. And we really have to look at the information and the data as it becomes available, which it is not. 
And that leads us perfectly into the next story. What do you mean the data is not available for approval of these vaccines and things like that? Well, keep in mind, when the FDA made a promise with the emergency use authorization, they promised that, and this goes into our next article, let's proceed. Um, they claimed, or they said, that they were going to release the data on how they come to the conclusion of approval. Something changed. Somebody wasn't honest. Somebody wasn't off forthright. And they reneged on their promise and they approved a vaccine that was supposed to be for public review without public review. So let us proceed as follows. We're going to read an article from the FDA. The FDA now. So British Medical Journal referenced the FDA. And this is from the senior editor of the British Medical Journal. I want to be very respectful and not add any uh, publisher bias. So let's proceed. Whatever one thinks about the 95% effective disclaims, my thoughts are here. We are going to go there. Delta may not be responsible. Enter Pfizer's preprint. As an RCT reporting up to six months of follow-up, it is notable that evidence of waning immunity was already visible in the data by the 13th of March 2021 data cutoff. Going back to the Lancet, which we saw right here. Keep that in mind, the Alpha variant, prior to the Delta variant taking hold. It all ties in. Something's happening. And doesn't have to necessarily be the Delta. But was that, was that because of waning immunity? I don't know. Again, but still, the questions have to be asked. And it's hard to imagine how the Delta variant could play a key role here for 77% of trial participants were from the United States, where Delta was not established until months after the data cutoff. Keep this in mind, too. Only 7% of the trial participants were blinded at six months. For those not familiar, we're talking the study, meaning we knew who was vaccinated, who was not vaccinated, per se. Only 7% of those individuals, which was important not to know who was what and would maintain a non-biased approach, remained blinded. Not physically blinded, blinded study-wise, per se, to perceive. Last December, with limited data, the FDA granted Pfizer's vaccine and emergency use authorization, enabling access to all Americans who wanted one. It sent a clear message that the FDA could both address the enormous demand for vaccines without compromising on the science. A full approval could remain a high bar. But here we are. The FDA, let's make this a little bigger. There we are. But the FDA reportedly on the verge of granting a marketing license 13 months into the still ongoing two-year pivotal trial with no reported data passed the 13th of March, 2021. Unclear efficacy after six months due to unblinding. How convenient. Evidence of waning protection, irrespective of the Delta variant, and limited reporting of safety data. The preprint reports decrease appetite, lethargy, Asthesia, asthesia, malaise, night sweats, hyperhidrosis were new adverse events attributable to the BNT162B2 not previously identified in early reports. It provides no data table showing the frequency of these or other adverse events. Events. So the editor is basically alluding to lacking all of the appropriate information that was required. Here we go. It is not helping matters that the FDA now says it will not convene its advisory committee to discuss the data ahead of approving Pfizer's vaccine. This is August 23rd, a few days before the approval. Last August, to address vaccine hesitancy. Lots of people out there are vaccine hesitant. The agency had committed to use an advisory committee composed of independent experts to ensure deliberations about authorization or licensure are transparent for the public. What happened? The FDA reneged. It did not have an advisory committee of independent experts to ensure deliberations about authorizations or licensure were transparent to the public. It just approved it anyways. And Wait till you hear the reason why they decided all of a sudden they did not need an advisory committee of independent experts to ensure deliberations about authorizations or licensure or any transparency to the public. Especially 
At this time, we have so many healthcare workers which are extremely hesitant in reference to this particular vaccine. Ask people about tetanus shots, no problem. The shady way that this is being handled, can you make it any more suspicious? But to proceed. The FDA should be demanding that companies complete the two-year follow-up as originally planned, even without a placebo group, because they already blew that, because they unblinded a lot of the participants. Um, they should demand adequate controlled studies using patient outcomes that now substantial population of who have recovered uh, from COVID, and regulators should bolster public trust by helping ensure that everyone can access, assess, access, please forgive me, it's 2.23 a.m., sometimes I enunciate improperly, the underlying data. Let us review, I just saw this up here real fast, uh, and this is important to point out. Despite reference to six months safety and efficacy in the preprints, the paper only reports on vaccine efficacy up to six months, but not from six months. This is not semantics. As it turns out, only 7% of the trial participants actually reached six months of blinded follow-up. So despite the, this preprint appearing a year after the trial began, it provides no data on vaccine efficacy past six months, which is the period Israel says vaccine efficacy has dropped to 39%. It's hard to imagine that under 10% of the trial participants remain blinded at six months, which presumably further dwindled after 13th of March, 2021, could constitute a reliable or valid sample to produce further findings, and the preprint does not report any demographic comparisons to justify future analysis. Now, I read this from the senior editor, and I wanted to take another look at it from basically a more positive article in reference to the FDA approving the vaccine. So let's delve into that real fast. Here we go. This is... FDA approves Pfizer biotech vaccine at record time. The American Medical Association, let's take it from both sides, right? The American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the American Nurses Association praised the FDA approval, saying that COVID-19 vaccines had already protected more than 100 million Americans. This vaccine is safe. It, presents, it prevents severe COVID-19 and it will save your life. The organization said in a joint press release. Sounds hunky dory, but let's go deeper into this article. Last week, the FDA was criticized for announcing that it would not hold a formal advisory committee meeting to discuss data supporting the approval. After saying last year that it was committed to using such a meeting to ensure deliberations about authorizations or licensure are transparent for the public. The agency told the British Medical Journal it did not believe that a meeting was necessary on this occasion. What changed? So basically the advisory committee, or I should say the FDA, promises, promised, promised open deliberation and approval and review of the data. They promised. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, they say, we don't think it's necessary. Now, this has nothing to do with being pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, anti-vax, or whatever. This has to do with honesty and integrity. And basically, when there is that massive a breach of integrity, even when it has a positive spin on it, does it make it any wonder among the healthcare community the healthcare community, people that normally do receive vaccinations and that are and not anti-vax per se. Is it any wonder why your healthcare worker or provider is reluctant? They're not conspiracy theorists. What they're saying is the FDA made a promise. The FDA broke that promise. And now you want me to continue trusting someone who already proven themselves not credible. Yeah, go ahead. Inject my children. Inject my friends, relatives, or loved ones. I don't care the fact that the FDA broke its word. I'll just take whatever you hand me. Is that what people expect? 
I mean, seriously, the problem, the onus, the responsibility of the vaccines is not on the person reluctant to take the vaccine. The onus, the responsibility, the argument, as far as convincing individuals, doesn't have to be a sales pitch. It has to, just has to do with doing what they said they were going to do in an honest, credible, noble fashion. If people are going to trust it after that, then that's a difference uh, of deliberation. The fact that the FDA broke its word, then approved it. No. Sorry. Not a good sale. And let's look at what the information was in reference to the senior editor said. Let's go to his data prior to then. It says as follows. Do, 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 do some of the information. Pain medications and blinding. He expressed the, role, the, the concern, the confounding, that a lot of individuals during the study, uh, let's just read through, because I don't want to add any publisher bias by accident, uh, confounding role of pain and fear medications to treat symptoms. It posited that such drugs could mask symptoms leading to undetection of COVID-19 cases, possibly in greater numbers in people who received the vaccine effort to prevent or treat adverse effects. However, it seems the potential to confound results was fairly limited, although the results indicate that these medicines were taken around three to four times, three to four times more often in the vaccine versus the placebo recipients, at least for Pfizer's vaccine. Moderna did not report as clearly. That said, the higher rate of medication used in the vaccine arm provides further reason to worry about unofficial unblinding. Understood? So the individuals which were vaccinated were taking three to four times more medication for certain ailments that were not being addressed during the trial. But to proceed, this is what is the most disturbing. Because now when the FDA had promised to have information available for public review, this is how long you get to wait now before you get any additional information potentially. Pfizer says it is making data available upon request and subject to review. This stops far short of making data publicly available, but at least leaves the door open. How open is unclear, since the study protocol says Pfizer will only start making data available 24 months after study completion. Moderna's data sharing statement states, quote, may be available upon request once the trial is complete. This translates sometime into the mid to late 2022. Things may have made noted for Oxford AstraZeneca, as well as Russian Sputnik, so on and so forth. As I said, quote, addressing the many open questions about these trials requires access to raw trial data, but no company seems to have to share the data with any third party at this point. Going back to basically what was said before, it is not helping matters. The FDA now says it will not convene its advisory committee to discuss the data ahead of approving Pfizer's vaccine. Last August, to address vaccine hesitancy, the agency had committed, committed to use an advisor to use an advisory committee composed of independent experts to ensure deliberations about authorization and licensure, which are transparent to the public. The agency told the British Medical Journal did not believe that a meeting was necessary on this occasion. Without having to add an additional pause or even have to worry about parsing my words, if you were a fact checker, whose facts should you be checking? Let's go right into the next article as follows. I mean, this is, I'm sorry if I pause on this too much. It, you, you, you have to understand, I'm, I'm seeing statements like this, and it is just these organizations are basically wonderful organizations, but they want uh, either blind trust or conformity. And now we're going to be vaccinating our entire military, our entire military, our children with a vaccine in which the data does not have to be presented because it's not necessary on this occasion. This is a global event. It is not just even the United States. 
Can you imagine if their questions arise, how bad this would be for international standing on the world stage if this does not present itself in a positive light two years or 2022 or whenever? It's, it is to me, I, that is, I'm still, I'm dumbfounded. And the fact that they can get away with it is astounding. But to proceed as follows, next kind of curiosity thing to make you say, hmm, here we go. Da, da, da. Scientists are growing Delta COVID variant in a lab purposely to infect humans who will be paid 4,500 pounds for taking part. Scientists are infecting volunteers as part of human challenge trials. I'm going to kind of leave you to dwell on this for a little bit because, again, you know who we cracked on down in a lot of countries for being irresponsible in reference to the virus. And I truly do believe in my heart that if you you follow outbreaks, uh, a lot of a lot of accidental releases happen all the time. It usually happens from somebody walking out of the lab that had been exposed. Not that they're trying to design and weaponize a virus to hurt people, but accidentally. Uh Many, many bio labs on a regular basis uh, accidentally release contagions all the time. And I'll show you a major one in a second. But this is interesting because they're actually manufacturing the Delta variant, which is obviously if it's everywhere, they have to manufacture it now. And then they're going to expose people to it uh, basically for this one reason. The study will initially aim to help doctors understand how the immune system reacts to different levels of coronavirus and how a person who is infected with COVID virus transmits infectious particles into the environment. All right. I have so many questions, but unfortunately, they're not all answered in this article. Uh, but they're tracking 18 to 30 year olds and whether they've been vaccinated or unvaccinated or whether they transmit or shed or whatever comes out to be, they can be locked in rooms. What's a, I have no, no freaking clue. But yes, we are manufacturing the Delta variant. So we can intentionally affect individuals, pay them quite a nice sum of money, and then see what happens. Which reminds me of this, just for uh, what's one of the worst bio releases that ever happened. It was in 2014, most of you never heard of. But I want to show you how things can go woefully wrong really fast. This is one of my favorite ones to save. Live poliovirus solution accidentally released into local water. Local water system. This is this is in Europe. Human error. September second, twenty fourteen. Forty five liters of concentrated live polio virus. Make that bigger, do, 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 just in case it hasn't rendered to four K yet. Were released into the environment by the pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline. But obviously everything else worked out. I guess. Forty five liters of concentrated live polio virus. Um, but they did issue a shellfish warning. But I guarantee most of you never hear of things like this. But now it does happen. And bad things like this does happen. As a precaution, a booster dose of polio vaccine was recommended to persons who have been in contact with the water river. So, yeah, that's really really but it does happen so when you look at articles like this you know and it's great research 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 science 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 you know all right and I, an Oxford University I love but however though you wonder wouldn't it be nice to at least input sometimes what type of safety precautions are being taken to make sure that uh, Billy Bob doesn't accidentally walk out of the uh, the study with Delta freshly infected with his brand new batch of Delta, uh, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, before he goes to the local spa, you know what I mean? It'd be nice to know, but there it is. Now, next, airborne transmission. This is a wonderful article. Part of it is, it's not an article necessarily, you know, against face covering and some masks. What it's actually an article for is for better face coverings and masks. All right. So I don't want to add, you know, dimensions to the study which are not intended. But what it is, it gives you an idea, for example, COVID not being considered to be aerosolized. 
how superfluous many of these pandemic mitigation measures may actually be. Again, or how futile would be a better word to put it. Um, you know, future data and studies need to be val to validate. But right now, if, as you look through this airborne transmission of respiratory viruses, let us just delve into it. Just give you a better understanding. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. How long can a virus, uh, a micron size, linger in the air? You have to do it as a trivia question. So you have a micron sized particle, someone sneezes and, you know, whatever it is. And they have, you know, how long will it stay in a room? My micron. Here we go. Ready? Big micron droplets, boom, boom, five seconds. Like it's raining, it's raining COVID. Five microns, 33 minutes in the air, jogging, jogging behind somebody. Yeah, they're gonna leave a, they're gonna leave a COVID screen for quite some time. One micron, 12 hours. So you're in a classroom, you can come back the next day and still that viral particle at one micron size is still lingering in the air. You see what I mean? So immune system is probably your best shot, but still here we go, I'm having a good immune system. Don't eat, lousy. Stay off the ultra processed foods which seem to be skyrocketing during this time. Here, ready for this one? Environmental factors. The time needed to reach a 99.99% inactivation varies from hours to months. The day rate can be quantified in terms of half-life, which is about approximately one to three hours for SARS-CoV and CRV in laboratory generated aerosols. So basically, you know, as far as viruses are concerned, probably like norovirus and things like that, but like months. So like maybe three hours uh, per se for the half-life. That's just the half-life. Half-life, not inactivation. To proceed, down the line. An outbreak of COVID. Now, this is interesting. This is when, you remember we had everyone was isolated to the homes and hotels and things like that. This is an interesting way that people don't think, because they're not thinking in a real-world setting, that a virus can spread. An outbreak of COVID-19 in a high-rise apartment building occurred. Let's make this bigger again. There is that. A little bigger. An outbreak of COVID-19 in a high-rise apartment building occurred along vertically aligned units that were connected by a single air duct, demonstrated that risk of airborne transmission is associated with shared air. So here you have it. You have everyone being locked in the room. You notice people go to the, the hotels or whatever it is, and they're quarantined when they travel. Is it really making a difference? It's all sharing the same air to the same air ducts. I mean, the HEPA filters are really important and things like that, but exactly how much is it dispersing? You know, I would have preferred to see UV-222 or UV lights installed, those ionization, heat. There's so many things that could have been done if we didn't rely upon Justinian plague uh, pandemic mitigation measures from the 1300s, masks, distancing, and so on and so forth. If we came to the conclusion that masks and distancing were not as effective as we would have liked, and we took a different route to boosting nutrition. If we decided to make sure that our hospitals were feeding nutrient rich foods, organics per se, or you know, fruits, vegetables, less steak, side dishes, and puddings, uh, and uh, you know, our ultra processed foods, boost their vitamin levels, nutrient levels even, well, maybe that'd be plus. UV lights in the hospitals, UV 222, uh, in public arenas, uh, 160 degree heat as far as disinfecting airplanes and things like that. If we came to the conclusion that we had better ways and better methods, uh, and we went that route instead, that would have gave us a lot brighter outlook in the future, not just for COVID, but for other things as well. But to proceed, da da da, going that wonderful article, the do 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 discussion. Ready for this? Think about the person wearing a surgical mask and a beard. Well, I'll read this to you. For aerosols, the two, the less than two and a half micron filtration efficiency decreases by 50% for a relative leak area of 1%. 50% reduction in filtration efficiency for a relative leak area of 1%. 
Now you think about your toddler or your child has a hard enough time keeping that mask on and I've seen a few prime ministers running around with the mask below the nose. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, you know, you have to look at it. It's he's what this the, what the author here, the research is saying, is before we work on better masks, even uh, we should work on better fitting masks. You know what I mean? Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 has occurred in healthcare settings despite medical masks designed for droplets, not aerosols. You see what I mean? For droplets, not aerosols and eye protection uh, which illustrates the need for proper personal protective equipment PPE and layering and multiple uh, interventions against airborne transmissions especially in high risk indoor settings probably like a face shield face mask or whatever it comes in to be but again uh, fooling ourselves in reference to that you know whatever proceed uh, distancing alone does not stop transmission is not sufficient without accounting for other measures I beat how long do those uh, aerosol droplets linger in the air? So if if you're not moving, maybe. Uh, but however, though, 12 hours lingering in the air, I don't know how well the ventilation systems are in planes right now, if it's actually sucking the air in on a regular basis, because it seems off when I'm in a plane, it seems like the air is pretty much stale. But outside of that, you think about things like that, you go, wait a second, you know, exactly how effective is this? Distancing alone does not stop transmission is not sufficient without accounting for other measures, such as ventilation, infiltration, the number of people emitting infectious aerosols, and the amount of time spent in closed spaces. It is important to note that proposed measures to improve indoor air quality will lead to long overdue improvements that have health benefits extending well beyond COVID-19. UV-254, UV-222, ozonation, heat. We discussed it before. It was last week. It said even... Mod, the mildest ventilation is still better than the best masks as far as preventing uh, disease mitigation. So what ends up happening is you end up taking all these people, you put them in nursing homes, you lock them away, and guess what? Recipe for disaster. To proceed as follows, let's get right into the research and let us begin. Da, da, da. Here we go. All right. There is database. That is the megabytes of the database in a zip file compared to all prior years. Dutch may want to see that. So our CDC personnel are totally, totally, totally overwhelmed. And good luck with that because, again, they said safety signals. So it's going to be a while before they can go through all that data to find out exactly what's legitimate and what's not. And meanwhile, we're just approving vaccines left and right without having to give any data publicly to the public that which is taking the vaccine. All right, let's see. Here we go. Da -da, mutations. No, no, no. Let's go to the various database. Let's go to the various database. Let's go there first. All right, and let us begin. Oh, it's really small. But let's go to the first thing first. Do, 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 do. All right. Again, these are reports to the various system that needs validation. Server injuries by age. 3,517 that need to be researched. Shingles, 12,963 reactions that need to be researched. That's the average age uh, per se. Uh, Ball's palsy, 5,393. And this is just the U.S. VAERS database. When we get to the European database, it, 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 it's way beyond the U.S. database. Proceed. All right. Da, 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 da. Thrombocytopenia, 2,938. Needs verification. Uh, paralysis, 4,532 reactions that re report reactions and require ver verification. Myocarditis, 4,376. Notice the, all of a sudden the age just drops as far as the average age. That's a, And again, I saw articles in the paper which are so misleading. They said the myocarditis reactions are no more than what's happening in the general public. But they're failing to address the issue. The average age of myocarditis in the public is in the 40s. The average age of myocarditis reports being submitted to VAERS, far less, including the outliers. Thrombosis, 7,000. COVID illness, I don't know if we want to call this breakthroughs or whatever it is. Uh, 
is 66,323. Uh, duplicate reports, still the same. A lot of duplicates out there. You gotta be really careful when doing the data analysis. Scrolling down. All right, our total reports submitted to VAERS, 484,961 as of August 20th. Uh, vaccine reports by age, I'm noticing a little bit of spike there. So you have 5,000 reports uh, submitted to, or 5,000 plus, just between the ages of 10 and 15. Wow. All right, here we go. Uh, reported COVID, COVID, COVID vaccine-related deaths stand at 6,112 as of this August 29th. Uh, by week, we'll skip through this for time expediency. This is, you can see the cutoff between the uh, VAERS reporting date of August 20th and still just the uh, mortality from COVID. It was pretty close there for a while. Mortality reports to VAERS compared to mortality reports in the wild of COVID. Uh, scrolling down, what happened here? Um, yeah, that was a major drop in vaccine reports. This is it. 484,961 reports in so far of this August 23rd, August, sorry, August 20th of 2021 versus all of 2020, 57,115. 484,961 VAERS reports versus 57,115 for all of 2020. Kind of says a lot. Scroll down. Most common texts related to the symptoms being felt in all individuals. Pause that for a second. Top 30 reported symptoms of all ages. Most of these are pretty superfluous, uh, but there's a lot of them. And of those, of those which are actually reported, these are the most common ones. Uh, from individuals which had succumbed, uh, the vaccine reports where death is related. These are the most common. Cardiac arrest stands out pretty strong. Acute respiratory as well. This is the bar chart as we go down the list. So you, you know, again, not a lot as far as collection, but you see a lot of COVID-19, a lot of COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, again, these are the most common text symptoms associated with individuals which had submitted reports to VAERS or of individuals submitted by someone else in reference to mortality. And so, you know, just seeing some of the things that are out there, a lot of chest pain, cardiac arrest, uh, so on and so forth. Going to that's the age reports of minors. A lot numbers, I have the middle there, the most, the lot numbers most associated with uh, reports of errors. Children. This is what's often. Reactive protein, chest protein, chest protein, chest pain, see reactive, chest x-ray, abdominal pain. Uh, top 30 reports in children. You know, there's chest pain again, because we're looking at a lot of that, it's especially with reference to myocarditis. Um, and there's myocarditis right there. You can see, but this is children. Scrolling down, uh, reports. I think that's if that, nothing else really there's just information for me as far as keeping an eye out for certain data. Let's go to the European, the, the Udura Village Vigilance. All we're looking at right here is we're looking at serious reports, just serious, that's it, all right? Let's go. Report a serious reactions. So we're looking at 300, if you could read that there, let's make this a little bigger. Da, 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 da. No, ah, we're too big. All right, so Pfizer, serious reactions. AstraZeneca, serious reactions associated. Moderna, serious reactions associated. Janssen, these are the serious, what they mean in the Endura Vigilance 
base is reactions that may have resulted in hospitalization. So that's what they're that's what they classify as a serious reaction. It doesn't say all reactions. All reactions at this point in time, I think, is at 857,741 for the, all the reactions. But for serious reactions, these are just the numbers. Number of individual cases identified in your vigilance, your, your, your vigilance with fatal designation. Fatal designation is exactly what it, we mean. Fatal designation means there was a death related or reported in relation to the vaccine itself. 14,048. Most common uh, word chart in reference to serious reactions. All right, here we are. These are the most common uh, terms associated with serious reactions. So again, a lot of joint pain, which is a little different than we have uh, here in the U.S. But again, to keep in mind, this is associated with hospitalization. So a lot of chills, a lot of joint pain, headache, fatigue, dizziness, and so on and so forth. And then you see the breakthrough infections, potentially, or whatever. Uh, yes, look at that's a huge number of anaphylactic reactions reported too. But it's, you see a lot of commonality there. And I like this because the main reason being is by doing this, by looking at two different databases and reference to vaccine reports, you, there's less bias or confounding, you know, depending on the general geography, uh, demography, uh, or demographics, that can, you could have like a mass hysteria, like food poisoning cases. Once people, you know, you'll see a lot of reports of food poisoning once they hear there's a food poison outbreak that's beyond normal range. So it's like, for example, like that. So you have, you have a control, but let us proceed as follows the next one. Let us now go to mutations. This is going to go look into the vaccine effectiveness campaigns, but here we go. And then we're going to go into the Delta variant, and then we'll probably call it a night real, real fast because we're running late on time again. I'm trying to get this all done with an hour, so please forgive me. But here we go. Just making things bigger. All right, first one. All right, we are going to, to, to do this all through the GISA, the variants. Now we're going to break down right off the bat. We're looking at right here. This is really weird. Check the people fully vaccinated per hundred. You reading that? See the blue line? And total cases per million. You see that? That's the correlation of 0.9. I'm not going to allude to more than that because there's so much more that goes into the data, but I just thought that's extremely interesting from February to August. And then they almost they're like like matching one to one. More than just parallel, I thought that was interesting, just by chance, I suppose. Uh, people fully vaccinated per 100 correlated with new deaths in smooth per million. It looked like it was working pretty well, and then the deaths began to rise again. Now, obviously, this is Delta variant, and um, yeah, it's like look at this level right here. So that level of mortality, uh, uh, new deaths smooth per million, is ironically higher than it was here. It could be seasonal. Keep that in mind. There's a lot, of, a lot of things that play a role into it before the vaccines really even began to take off. All right, here we go. Remember this line once again. Uh, people fully vaccinated. This is for countries which have greater than 40 uh, per 100 vaccinated in total cases per million. So it's important. Here we go. Ready? So we're looking at this. Let me make this a little smaller. So I'm going to go smaller still. All right. Ah, go, 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 go. There. All right, here we go. So this is what we're looking at between February and now. So you're looking at right there is about 70,000 cases per million. And this is countries which have a greater than 40 per 100 vaccinated and a human development index of 0.64. So fairly modern countries. And these are the countries which have more than 40 uh, vaccinated per 100. So you see, you see quite a, a good mix, all right? And then this right here, which I should have alluded to, is the cases per million. So you can go down the line right here. There's the United States cases per million. Yeah, it is that high. I had to double check. 
So in the 120,000 range now. So that's cases per million. And this is the vaccination rate, 40 per 100. Over 40 per 100. So this is the deaths of countries which you have 40, over 40 or 100 vaccinated and new deaths news per million. So you're looking about a little over one there. And this is the people fully vaccinated per 100. So you see, it's up to the 50 line. So this is the vaccinated per 100. This is the new death smooth per million. So you have two axes there. Now we're going to countries which are under 40, 39 or less. All right, this is the people fully vaccinated per 100. Right there, it's about 30. They're averaging out. That is our cases per million. This is the cases per million of the countries which are heavily vaccinated. So heavily vaccinated countries have 70,000 cases per million. Mildly vaccinated countries have cases of 50,000 per million. All right, let's keep on going. And these are those countries. You can see the lines right there across the board. There's Russia, for example. Uh, deaths per million. See, the deaths per million are three. So keep in mind the deaths per million in reference there are a little over one. So you have less deaths per million, but you have a lot more cases per million in the countries which are fully vaccinated, a lot more. Let's proceed. All right, there's that. Countries under 20 per 100 vaccinated. This is the line of the countries which are heavily vaccinated. That's their cases per million. This is the country, cases per million of the countries which are basically under 20 per 100, which are vaccinated. See right there, the blue line is your vaccine, your vaccine levels. And so, remember, we're working with the vaccines. We're looking at this axis here. With the uh, case of Vermilion, we're looking at this axis here. All right, and so how they compare to the 40 and under. All right, so the cases of 20 and under are, are doing better. How they compare into the cases, uh, just to show you again, of the 40 and above. So you see the trend there. Now let's go to even a greater extreme. How is our mortality? Mortality is about two and a half. All right, so they're looking at that. Let's go to a greater extreme. Under 10 per 100 vaccinated. You see the chart? This is the cases per million in countries which are 40 or more, 40 to 100, 40 of 100 vaccinated. And there we are. Our cases are about 27,000 per million of the places which are hardly vaccinated, as you can see right there, compared to heavily vaccinated. You see the numbers? That's really tough to rationalize. If you were an alien from another planet looking at this blankly, and you had to compare the vaccine rate from countries which are under 10 per 100 versus countries which are vaccine rates are at 40 or greater per 100? What would you think? I mean, seriously, what would you think? That's just the data. And these countries which we're looking at right now are Algeria, Egypt, Guatemala, Iran, Iraq, Kyrgyzstan, Libya, Nicaragua, Palestine, South Korea, Tajikistan, Thailand, and so on and so forth. And you could see the level and but again they have the same human development index of 0.64 and india must have just moved up the scale yeah there's india just barely under now they're a little bit more than 10 or more and uh you know that's they're barely vaccinated but they must have just made that 10 threshold so you see what i mean now let's look at this real fast let's keep it going that's all of our countries comparatively Making it smaller, eventually. There we are. You see the 40 to 100? There, it's all shaman, sharing, shaman. They're all sharing the same y axis. 
that give you a better comparison? There's India. Just moved to the 11 range. So they got more, they did receive more vaccines. And then let's go here. Vaccine variants, because we're going to use the India as our control primarily. Whoops. Uh, let's go back for up, up, up. Don't have to see all the graph at once. Vaccine variant, Delta. There's deaths per million in the United States. You see, they're way high. They're high. The United States is higher than, than the countries, for example, that are way less vaccinated overall. In fact, the United States is skewing it upwards. So, yeah, it's like, wow, the United States is higher than all of them. Um, the skyrocketing. All right. Positivity rate. Fully vaccinated. Yeah, we got tons of people vaccinated. We're not doing much better, it appears. Uh, there's a vaccine rates. Moving a little fast here. India, barely vaccinated. Delta's the primary. Deaths per million. United States is up here. India is down here. Positivity rate. What the heck? Sweden. Remember Sweden? No distancing, no mask for whatever. They, or whatever is little. They weren't into the pandemic mitigation thing. Look at that. Deaths per million. 0.2 compared to the United States, 3.45. Positivity rate, a little higher, 0.05. Was the United States again? Uh, United States positivity rate was 0.14. Sweden's positivity rate is 0. There's 0.14. 0.053 or something like that. Yet the gist, and there's its vaccination rate, just about close to the United States still. And then our variants. This is the Delta variant. That's of August 23rd, 2021. So if you want to eliminate the Delta variant and look at the other variants, there we can. You can see the other variants, for example, like Cambodia and things like that. They have the Alpha variant. Japan has the Alpha variant, a little bit there. Brazil has a Gamma variant. Uh, you, you get an idea. I'm making this a little bigger. Uh, but the Delta variant, obviously, is the predominant. And if you go all the way back, if you want to look at the Delta variants, for example, you look at other variants as well. If you go all the way back. This is what I'm using so we can spot out new variants. Um, you go all the way back when the vaccines were first being produced. Let's go back as far as May 31st. And Delta, you barely see it. So if we take Delta out of the picture, it doesn't make a dent. But now that's the primary. I mean, Zambia had tons of it. Singapore did. And this is just in May. Compare that with now. Delta. It barely, it's it's like, doesn't even play into the, I mean, it's it's everywhere. So these are all the countries that are all just pure Delta now, except for a few of them, at least the ones that did the reporting. Some of them, they don't report on a consistent basis, but you can get an idea. All this, this uh, bluish purple, whatever color you call it, is all Delta. So that just gives you an idea. Well, it's getting late, and I think, oh, uh, we're pretty much, let's call it a night. Uh, the COVID rebuild thing, if we go here, uh, let's look at this real fast. This is the average age of individuals, uh, unfortunately, which are succumbing to, um, which are succumbing to COVID. Make this a little bigger. And so, yeah, that's the mortality if you break it down. 75 to 84, 85 or older, uh, 65 to 74. It's still uh, basically, um, unfortunately, uh, a pandemic that really tends to help, uh, really affect those which are um, uh, older, without a doubt.
I, I mean, as far as that's concerned, but even as far as 50 or older. I mean, there's comorbidities and things that we could basically weed through as well, but that's the data as it stands. Um, yeah, so it really has a strong impact on individuals which are, you know, have, uh, older uh, per se. And then let's look at the, the game here with Florida, New York, and everything else. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Do, 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 do. Here we are. Uh, we're looking at basically deaths per 100,000. So you see right there. Now, if you take this out of context, oh, without a doubt, uh, California, New York appear to be doing better as far as deaths per 100,000. But however, though, when you put it in context in reference to blame it on the vaccines and things like that, you know, Florida's there. The other states which have more deaths per 100,000, which are have a much higher vaccination rate. And again, it's not to bemoan vaccines. I'm just trying to draw controls to see exactly how effective they are. Uh, and then where is Oklahoma, Florida, da, 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 Louisiana. See, so all these are much higher. There's Texas right there. So that's the midpoint, right? With this red, with the red uh, line is along the, um, so that's basically the average along the y-axis here. And so, you know, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Alabama, Massachusetts, Louisiana, South Dakota, um, Arkansas, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Mexico. Uh, again, they're not doing anywhere near as well as Florida or Texas. And they're pretty much known for not being too much a reference to pandemic mitigation lockdowns nor pushing the vaccines. So again, I, you can't make the determination. But otherwise, it is late. Thank you very, very much for being up with me. It, it is now 3, 10 a.m. It takes a little while for the process at 4K, but to review real fast. All right, we looked at the Lancet. We looked at basically the information in reference to that window of opportunity between the first vaccine and the second vaccine. Uh, it seems to be a pretty uh, sensitive time. We looked at the antibody response, uh, where they're going to go for a fourth dose of SARS now to see exact uh, vaccine to see how it goes. Uh, the shedding, yep, it's happening. And so FDA approval, yeah, I'm not going to dwell on this one too much, but however, though, they there was a major breach of trust there, and they, there needs to be some enlightenment uh, as to why, and they shouldn't get off that easy. Um, same thing, Crows, same thing. Yes, we are manufacturing. Just, just when you thought there was enough Delta to go around, we were manufacturing more. Um, and then airborne transmission. Uh, really interesting article as far as how things float and stay and so on and so forth. And then the database is well covered. But again, it has been, wow, it's been 68 minutes, 3, 11 a.m. Gratitude, thank you. Look forward and talk to you all next week. I have to apologize. Not a lot of information in reference to helping prevent things as far as uh, supplementation, prophylactics, so on and so forth. But it goes in two-week cycles. And every every two weeks, they they it goes into questioning the vaccine, the mask, and so on and so forth. And the week after, it goes into basically things that may help uh, keep people well outside of masks and distancing of vaccines. Regardless of that, gratitude, thank you, and humbly, I will look forward to see you all again next week. See you then. Bye.